a reading from 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. We know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. from the 13th chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Paul is at his finest as he pens these beautiful words. I learned a new word about the scripture this week as I read about our passage today. This chapter is referred to as an encomium, a word I'd never heard before, a speech of praise, an encomium about the gift of love. The eloquence of Paul is something I've always admired in this text. We tend to sentimentalize it though. Do you notice that? To romanticize it, which really isn't all that surprising considering how often it's used at weddings. Indeed, Len and I read out from this text, or someone read for us this text when we were married nearly 30 years ago. It is a beautiful, text to read at a wedding. It reminds us, and particularly it reminds the two marital partners that they both need to work hard to maintain the, the gift of love as a centerpiece in their life together. It shows the power and the challenge of love, proclaiming that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
This is a test, a text that sharpens our understanding of love. It, let a, it help, lets us know more about what love is, especially as we look at the way that we treat each other. Of course, Paul wasn't talking about weddings when he wrote this text. He was writing in this lyrical essay about love. He was writing about the, the crucial need to love one another within the church, to hold each other in mutual concern and consideration. It's helpful to look at chapter 13 a little bit in its historical context. Paul had been to Corinth. We've been talking about this in the last couple of weeks. He had worked to establish a church there. It was still a new community of faith, trying to figure out what it was to be a church. What is a church in the first place? This early in the first century, trying to figure out how to, to move through the world as believers in Jesus Christ, who were linked together in love. So now Paul is responding to a letter that he had received from that fledgling church, a letter that had raised questions about the foundations upon which Christian life and faith should be built. In Paul's absence from Corinth, because he had gone on to plant other churches in other communities, there was debate. There were confusing new ways of thinking that were competing with each other within the Corinthian church. Debate that developed about the importance of various spiritual gifts that were manifesting themselves among the believers. We've talked about the gift of speaking in tongues, for example, glossolalia, it's called. Speaking in the language of the angels, it's sometimes called. A, a gift that some in Corinth were exploring and then using and then lording over others, not building up the body. And so in chapter 12, we talked about how Paul focused on being members of the body of Christ together, on how we are to build up that body and all we do and to build one another up, using a still more excellent way than all these spiritual gifts. That's how he ends chapter 12. I will show you a still more excellent way. And then outflows the lyrical verses of chapter 13. That excellent way is love. At first, Paul indulges the Corinthians in this chapter. He goes into a, a lovely patient discussion celebrating the gifts of prophecy and tongues of faith and charity. He acknowledges that these are good things, these gifts of the Spirit. They're signs of the vitality of the Christian community. And they are beneficial to the church when these gifts are exercised well within it for the building up of the body. Yes, earnestly desire these spiritual gifts, he says, but in the end, there is a more excellent way. So we get to the, the middle section of chapter 13, and love is described. Love is, says Paul. Love is this, love is that. We heard a lot about what Paul said about love. Notice that he speaks about love in both positive and negative terms. He comes at it from both angles. He says, love is patient and kind, attributes that in other parts of his letters he uses to refer to God. God is patient and kind. God's love is patient and kind. Our love for one another should be the same. But then he starts talking about the, the things that love is not. He comes from the negative side. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. The weight of Paul's message falls on these eight 
negative aspects in the list, most of which correspond uncomfortably strongly with the behavior of the Corinthians in the church in Corinth. Paul describes their behavior elsewhere in the letter, and it is really clear as he describes what love is not, that he's hitting pretty close to home for them. Love is not envious. Uh, a rivalry, an intense rivalry has, has grown up in the church in Corinth, and, and Paul is saying that has no place in our life together. In love, we don't envy one another. We don't act contentiously toward one another. Love is not envious. It does not pull us apart from one another. Then he says love is not arrogant or boastful. One, one translation says love is not puffed up. A, maybe a stronger way to put it. He's been reprimanding the Corinthian community for the way some of them are puffed up about their spiritual gifts being better than others and others feeling excluded or left out, not important, not essential to the life that they share in Jesus Christ. Knowledge, he said, puffs up, but love builds up. And then he talks about Love is not rude. A harsh way to speak about the Corinthian, Corinthian community, but it's behavior that he has observed in their midst. They're starting to get the message, I'm sure, that this behavior of theirs contradicts the character of love as Paul shares it. So Paul has said, what is love not? Well, now let's go back and talk about what love is. Love is that which bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. It's as though he's used that central section talking about what love is not, to remind them of their behavior in the Corinthian church. But then he takes them back to the gift that is love and the challenge that is love and reminds them of how valuable it is to live in love together, to bear all things with one another and for one another to believe all things, to hope all things, to endure all things with and for one another. These things build up the body of Christ. They build community and strength with one another. Love never ends. Love never fails us. The Corinthians stung by the recognition of how their behavior has pulled away from love, can channel themselves back in to a recommitment to living in God's way of love. Paul ends the text with a favorite trio of his, words that mark the character of Christian existence. He talks about them in other places as well. He says, so now, faith and hope and love abide. These three, faith and hope and love, dwelling together in our life in the church. These three, and the greatest of these is love. It's the greatest because it undergirds the other two and everything else in our life together, and it gives meaning to our faith and to our hope. Love is the ground of our meaning in Christ. 
Paul speaks a strong word to the church at Corinth. I wonder if, if this chapter was the heart of what he is trying to say, not only to this community, but to all of the early church. It's no wonder this letter was treasured and passed from place to place, even though it criticized the Christian community. You know it must have been transformative or they wouldn't have wanted to share it with anybody. But instead it was passed from Christian to Christian, from church to church, and shared through the early years, and now passed down to us. And we read it afresh. I invite you every time you go to a wedding and hear that text, not just to think about the couple in love, but to think about your own love, how you live it out. Is it something that is sometimes challenging for you, bearing all things, believing all things, hoping all things, enduring all things in love. It's a gift and a challenge together. But it's, it's not just about two people loving each other. It's about the love we share with one another, the ground of our existence in Jesus Christ, the, the source of meaning in our church, that love that is poured into us by God through Christ and that enlivens us and guides us as we gather in Christian community. Love is the ground of our meaning. And indeed, anything we do, if it is done without love, is meaningless. Paul makes that clear. If I do things without love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Interesting note, by the way, bronze work was a major activity in the city of Corinth, the making of bronze vessels. And so talking about a, a clanging, noisy gong speaks directly to the people of Corinth. In, in several places in our text, he uses references that speak directly to the work of the Corinthian people. They also work with mirrors. They're, they're well-known mirror makers in the first century. So he says, now I look within a mirror dimly, then I shall see face to face, connecting directly with the Corinthian community. But, but if I do all wonderful things, if I exhibit spiritual gifts with the best of them, but don't have love, it's meaningless. It's nothing. Love is the source of all of our meaning. And love, says Paul, is not something that just springs up in you, that emerges overnight. It's not just a, a one-time decision and all of a sudden, bingo, you love perfectly. Love is a cultivated art. It's something that's mu that must be practiced, rehearsed. It's kind of what I think a church service sometimes is in a way. A, a practicing, a rehearsal of our loving one another and our worshiping God. You don't just do it automatically unless you hone it in your life. You create channels in your life for love to move freely, for worship to be natural. And so we gather week after week after week and we practice and we rehearse together. We love one another. Sometimes I, I find it remarkable when I'm engaging in the larger world outside of the Christian community because we practice so hard together that, that love really is a topic on our minds. And sometimes it's a harsh reality in the world that we forget about love. We get on with business and climbing the social ladder and, and gaining all of our resources and building up our retirement and taking care of our families and those closest to us and we forget about that clarion call to love. 
how important it is for us to practice again and again and again. We've got to get it right in the church so we can take it out into the world and bear that love and share that love and model that love for any who are struggling with it in the day-to-day -day grind or in the frightening circumstances or the upsetting challenges that face us in life. Love is something that requires the formation of our character. We don't just teach it to our children, we teach it to each other and practice it side by side, day by day. It's a habit that's not learned overnight. Living love, that's something you hear from this preacher all the time. Are you tired of it? Nope. nope. Amen. Amen. <laughs> For those online, I heard the word nope a lot. I hope you said it too. It's not something we get tired of, is it? It's not something for just a season in this church. We have claimed that as our, our motto, our theme, our, our words of guidance, living love, living the love of Jesus Christ in our own hearts and in our life together and in our life in the world which God loves. Living love. It, it wasn't just a, a sermon series. It wasn't just this year's topic. It's something that has guided us and strengthened us and brought us closer together in Jesus Christ. We've wrestled with challenges in our, our culture, challenges in our denomination, challenges in the midst of a pandemic together, guided by that, that wonderful understanding that the living love of Jesus Christ is present in our midst and that it demands something from us. It requires something. It invites something. It celebrates something already here in us. Living love. It's a cultivated practice in our life together. So let's use this Sunday when in our study of 1 Corinthians we happen to come upon the love chapter, as people sometimes call it. Let's not just hear it as that thing we read at weddings. Let's hear it afresh and ask, how am I living the love of Jesus Christ here in this community of faith and out there in the world? But here in the church, how does the living love of Christ guide my relationships with others? Guide my choices about what I suggest we do, what I begin as a ministry in the church, what I contribute my time and my heart to, what I offer my giving for, what I use my spiritual gifts to enhance. How do I engage with the living love of Jesus Christ. It's the criterion by which we should assess all of our ministries, and we seek to do that. Even the very finest of our ministries, if they do not have love, they are nothing, Paul would tell us. We learn from today's text that love isn't just a matter of feelings. Feelings come and go, but love never and as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, poof, it's gone. But faith and hope and love abide. And the greatest of these, the undergirding of it all, is love. Okay, so the text is read at weddings. That's, that's a, a time when two people make a covenant together, a lifelong covenant to love one another. So let's run with that covenant theme. I wonder if, if we could read 1 Corinthians 13 as a covenant, a vow between ourselves, a covenant with one another. We, we pledge to be patient and kind, not envious or boastful or arrogant 
or rude, not to insist upon our own way, not to, to work for injustice, to work for that which is wrong, but to work always for the right. Instead of all of the negatives, we will bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Our love will never end. All the other things of life may cease, but our love will never end. How does our life change when we make that covenant with one another? It's what we do ultimately when we stand up in front of the congregation and become members of the church. We vow to love and support one another. But this text brings it up close, again, afresh, anew. We vow to make love the practice of our life together, to, to make it the meaning which undergirds all of our ministries, the source of our joy in life together. I, I found it just wonderful to dwell with a text, sometimes chastising me this week. And in recent weeks, I've been reading about love for weeks, knowing the sermon was coming up. And sometimes it chastises me and reminds me and, and nudges me and corrects me. I'm thinking afresh, but also it invites me to deepen my bonds with beloved members of my, my family in Christ and to deepen my bonds of love as I carry that out into the world. Love never ends. Instead of letting fear or irritability or, or pride or, or arrogance or any of the other struggles of our life influence our life together, we will love. We do love. We move forward because of love. We survive a pandemic through our love for one another and our love for the world that God loves. Faith and hope and love abide. And we covenant together that the greatest thing in our life as a family of faith is and will always be the love of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 And thanks be to God.